Welcome to the second part of our Ender review, where we continue to dissect the structure and brilliance of this unique Star Wars story called Endor. In this episode, we'll focus on episodes 7 to 12, and how this part continues to build upon the setup of the initial stages. If you haven't seen our first episode, definitely do, as this will highlight how episodes 1 to 6 cover the first two stages of the Freitag Pyramid. Leonard, knowing what you know now, do you think this setup was done correctly. In a previous episode, I explained how I'm all about characters and character motivations and how I missed it. Mm -hmm. Now, I did some reading, I read the Tony Gilroy article and knowing now that the show is about leadership and creating a leader, then yes, the first episodes are a great setup for Andor becoming a leader. Yeah. In the first episodes he gets pushed around like a pawn, but in prison he learns to stand up for himself and take leadership, so great setup. It's good that you mentioned that interview, I also read it myself. For those interested we'll put it in the description below. So this quote, it's about going from five seasons to two seasons, because he mentions, I wonder what would happen if we now sped up our storytelling, because we've done such a rigorous job along the way of being so detailed. And he went and told that to Kathleen Kennedy, that he wanted to go from five to two seasons, no expectation of what would happen. And they were like, no, 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 we're into that. So they gave him quite a free range to do whatever he wanted to do. Yeah, and like he said in his interview, you know why you hired me, and he delivered. I feel like there's not a lot of studio involvement, as, as for example in Kenobi. Yes, which probably stems from the fact that Tony Gilroy was already brought in to be the script doctor for Rogue One. So he did already save that movie and earn that trust, so it kind of makes sense. Anyways, so we find ourselves in the third act or the seventh episode and this is on Freitag's pyramid seen as the climax and in traditional film talk it's called the midpoint. As Freitag was looking much at stage plays he would look at either classical tragedies or classical comedies and this is the moment where everything either starts to improve or fall apart. We can definitely see that after the heist, Cashin has learned a lot from his mistakes, especially if we look at him trying to save Namek, even though that goes wrong. And he tries to escape with his mother, but that also goes wrong. So he leaves and then he gets captured and then goes into a prison called Nakina 5. Now this felt like a quite rapid and coincidental switch to the fourth arc, but what do you think of that? That's the only thing I find weird. He's arrested for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I did some research because like the last episode, I, I missed a few things, but it's the only thing I can find wrong place, uh, wrong time. Well, if, if you know what happened, uh, please leave it in the comments. Especially since he successfully escaped the heist, and him being arrested randomly, it just feels kind of underwhelming. Now, I understand that if he was arrested for the heist, it would bring a lot more complications that would change the whole story, so I get why they're doing it. And, of course, it shows how corrupt the Empire is, which makes me, as a viewer, hate them even more, but also makes me understand and those growing hatred towards them. What I think this definitely does is a very big part of the world building. Mm -hmm. Because in the prison, they basically have people just working like slaves. Mm -hmm. So how was the Death Star built? This is not done by people that earn a minimum wage. It's very much a prison where people just never get out of. They're just switched from another complex from the prison. And they're trying to get people into those prisons by a very corrupt system. I think that there's some interesting choices made in the show in terms of world building where they're kind of trying to show in, in a lot of ways that this whole system of bureaucracy is so jaded and so powerful and so corrupt in that power. For instance, with the torture of Bix or him trying to get away and them shaping his words and that whole dialogue of Why would I be running? Because you're a part of it. Part of what? I'll ask the question. It's the same way as, for instance, Cyril Karn's whole conversation with his fellow officer and how it's very inconvenient that these people were killed now and we'll make up a story around it. It's just showing how corrupt all this is. And then in itself, if I may come back to the other episode, is more than enough motivation for him as well to get even more disgruntled by this Orwellian dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I get the corruption and I really liked what they did with the prison. Like, you, you never get out of here. But it probably would have made more sense to me if it was on a ferrix like planet now it's a sort of beach resort planet i don't know if that's the place that the empire would arrest random people 
thinking back of the lesson of Brandon Sanderson. Each character or location you add has the potential to add 500 to 1,000 words to your scene or story. Every time you put a character in, they cost something from your word budget. I'm not at all a fan of formulaic writing, but I'm sure there's a truth to this formula. And I'm sure there's a translation to be made to screenwriting. I do think you have an interesting point if you introduce this new location without having the actual time to flesh out the, the lore or, or the meaning of this location. It might even feel more odd because I in my head might fill it in as a Miami Vice type of location, but it might be meant as a tax haven or his non-extradition safe haven. So from a writer's perspective, definitely make sure that if you introduce a new location, you have enough time to actually introduce this location and give people the right idea about it. Um, but yeah, to the next act. This act to me proves that this is one of the most brilliant things we're gonna get out of the Star Wars universe for a while. And it's because of, if you look at writing structure, they use the second act or the rising action to challenge Andor and his hubris then turns into the climax where he himself has to learn from the mistakes he made in the second act. In the fourth act he learns about leadership and I thought it's also quite funny that a heist and prison escape are basically the antithesis of each other in the same way that a falling action and rising action are the antithesis of each other. If this show shows anything, and I don't want to jump to conclusions too early, but I have to say this, is that actions have consequences, the deaths feel real, the way that Andor leaves everyone behind, there's consequences to all of this, and it is truly a brilliant character study, in my opinion at least. My critique last time didn't come from Andor being badly written, it's very well written, it came more out of curiosity for more as a world building lover. Yeah. Like for example, how did the Empire treat the Aldani and what's the meaning of the eye, etc. I just want to know more about the planets and stuff and especially since it's a, a one-off, knowing that Andor was supposed to get five seasons, my ideal setup would have been season one, uh, Ferrix plus the heist in about 10 to 12 episodes. And then season two, his time in prison and the great escape. Then you would have gotten more time with the characters and locations that are interesting. It is quite tempting to outline those five seasons. And I do think that they would have been amazing. But understandably, they would have taken very long to create. However, before we go into the fifth act, I also wanted to talk about Luthen and Mon Mothma because this is written by Bo Willimon and you can definitely feel prime House of Cards type of writing in this act, this political intrigue and a very mature version of Star Wars that George Lucas definitely tried to approach in the prequels but never was able to. I haven't watched House of Cards but the political system reminded me of Game of Thrones or... or any funeralistic system in, in general with the, with the betrothal of the daughter and all. Uh, and another political thing that was illustrated quite nicely was the difference between the higher and lower regions of society. Like for example how the higher ranks like Luthen or Mon Mothma can just easily sacrifice their own people whilst the lower executive forces do what's necessary to keep the team safe. The last episode definitely emphasized this. Because you do, you can notice that people with money, so Mothma, Luther, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even Miro, who, who is in like an authority, it's those with power and without power. You can see that Andor and Karn, they're both disgusted by how easily the deaths of other people are neglected. And that's something that you can see from Mothma and, and Luther. Like Mothma, easily sacrifices and incriminates her husband. Luthen easily gets Krieger and co killed, which is also very nicely done all in the background. You know that it's happening mm -hmm. and they trust you that you can put those two together. Yeah, it's way more suspenseful when you don't see it than when it's in plain sight. I think it's death of the author a little mm. bit where you know that power of putting something with your audience and letting their imagination fill that in. Yeah, and the same goes for the sound of the creatures as a torture device. And again, you don't necessarily have to see or hear it, but you can see the effect of it. That of itself becomes yeah. more effectful and dooming. It's the scare of the unknown. I think as a writer, you're easy to control your reader and your reader's experience. But by letting that interactive 
moment happen where you omit things, the story becomes theirs as much as yours. Now, what did you think of the final two episodes? To me personally, episode 11 could have been left out, I guess, but it did a good setup for episode 12, which in my opinion, mm -hmm. man, it's, it's the best the series has to offer and perhaps in the entire Star Wars franchise. Yes, I, I completely agree with you that episode 11 didn't do much for the plot, but it did set up a lot of things. Mm. It's this darkest hour thing. We're slowly seeing this maelstrom of, of ships all being drawn in, all being brought to this little funeral, this little dark moment, this point of collision. In little vignettes you see the bomb being built, Bix has to be saved. There's so many elements there that have to be drawn to, to each other and to finalize it in that way, to make sure that that collision happens in such a rewarding way, where Karn and Miro get together in the end and it's very easy to, to neglect how much buildup in the previous acts have made this possible. And let's not forget the music. At least to me, the music with the gloomy horn players and the flute players on Rick Flo. Yeah. Really powerful scene. That's also just to draw back, and I, I don't mean to slight you in any way, but just to draw back on the fact that you're saying like, hey, I don't feel everything. You probably felt it th at this moment as well. Yeah, right? on the phone we discussed Chekhov's gun and I think it's true for Andor. Everything that's been in introduced in the previous episodes all falls into place here. From Namek's manifest, which was really powerful, to the guy Andor owed money to, to the kid that built the bomb to avenge his father. And in, in the previous review, I might have expressed myself too negatively, but episode 12 was a really powerful one and mm -hmm. makes a really great series. It's remarkable how many loose components now fit into this big puzzle. Also, people that aren't there anymore, but what kind of presence they leave. Mm. Um, and I like that in the world building with Clem, and him in episode 12 going to the brick of Clam yeah. and then basically having yeah, a flashback yeah. so that the flashback doesn't seem in vain. The the whole being a brick and becoming part of Ferrix. There's just so many parts in the world building as well that uh, really, really rung home to me. And, and then that speech, of course, from Marva was, was very well done. But I feel like for a series, usually writers have the tendency to use dialogue as filler. But here it felt like everything had a reason for being there and it's extremely rare to find that on disney plus or netflix like these stre big streaming things that just need content and content and content that is a huge compliment to tony gilroy and uh, the, the other writers so just to come back on the whole five act structure and to kind of conclude this i think that it's incredible how in the exposition you can set up your characters and set up your moving parts without giving away too much of where this is going then having them go through a point where they are able to make mistakes and show their weaknesses it is high intensity going to a part that feels like it's a moot point like an empty space which is then the climax where they have to make choices and these choices come from these mistakes and thus then they get to learn from these in the fourth act with it which is the falling action and this fact of that there's in this prison this whole transformation for Andor where that comes back in the end where Bix now believes in him and everyone starts to believe in him because he eventually did come back and save them it is as a character study we've found something in Andor and that it we were rewarded by staying with him you know in a tragedy it does show so well how much people can lose and how much they can grow from it that little exercise in minimalism that we talked about in Kenobi I think that that is exactly what we were talking about that we see implemented here so all in all I I really love this experience and I can't wait for 2024 yeah great series and let us know in the comments what do you think and don't forget to like and subscribe and press the bell button exactly uh, let us know where we missed something let us know uh, if you agreed with us and also thank you for listening and if you want to hear more about what we think of the star wars universe then we have a review of kenobi we have part one of this episode so there's always something here thank you for listening and see you in the next one